right. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to be presenting my research today that I did for one of my classes at IWP called Cyber Statecraft. And for this course, we really just got to pick a topic that we were interested in in the cyber domain. And I thought one way I can better learn about China is looking at different cyber attacks. And I thought it'd be really interesting to start to look at PRC cyber attacks against Taiwan and see lessons that we can learn from that. I also gave a similar talk on this uh, last month at the Citadel. It was a shortened version of this, and I got really good feedback from different national security professionals, students. Um, so I look forward to hearing your feedback after this, because this is an ongoing topic. It's not all encompassing. So I'd love to hear ways that you think I can improve my research on this topic. OK. OK, so what I just want to start with is looking at the PRC's warfare doctrine in general, because you really have to start to understand that if you want to understand Chinese cyber warfare. So the way that I define it is a combination of protracted warfare and also unrestricted warfare. So for protracted warfare, that's essentially what the Soviet Union did to the US during the Cold War. And that's when you move the correlation of forces away from your adversary over time without them noticing. So you're trying to chip away at them for all different domains through economic actions, military actions, try to shake their public support, just to weaken your adversary overall without them really noticing that you're doing so. But then the PRC, they also have this doctrine called unrestricted warfare, that it was created in the 1990s by two different colonels in the People's Liberation Army. So the idea is that you can have a weaker country, so to say, defeat a more technologically advanced country with a small military. So it's a warfare doctrine on how you can beat your adversary if they have stronger conventional forces than you. So this is about warfare in all the different domains to avoid kinetic warfare. So technology is a key component of unrestricted warfare because it sees technology as the connector of all conventional and unconventional battlefields. And it's the link that allows the PRC to launch a full spectrum offensive against its adversaries, particularly the United States. Um, so just one goal for China when you're thinking of the PRC's warfare doctrine is that it wants to weaken the United States over time in all battlefields. So one interesting thing about the PRC in their military is that they have this fusion of cyber and psychology within their military structure. So there's one specific entity that's called the PLA's Strategic Support Force. And so this was done after a reorganization in 2015 under Xi Jinping. So it's a theater command level organization. And so it centralizes space, cyber, electronic, and psycho psychological warfare missioning capabilities. And so it's mainly responsible for these um, psychological and cyber warfare against the United States in particular. So what's interesting about this is that it highlights the PRC's understanding of the information domain as a strategic resource in modern warfare. And another interesting thing about the PRC is that they see information control as the key to maintaining and growing its power. So you can look at that two different ways, domestically and internationally. So if you're looking at it domestically, information control allows the CCP to remain its tight grip on its population, which will keep the CCP in power and get rid of any dissidents that they might have. But then if you look at it from an international point of view, it allows the PRC to portray its authoritarian structure as a good alternative to Western liberal democracies and paint the PRC in a positive light on the international stage, which can aid in increasing Chinese influence, particularly in developing nations and developing regions of the world. So now I just want to start to go a little bit more into information warfare, which is what this research really focused on. So just to define information warfare up front, it's the usage and management of information to gain a competitive advantage over an opponent. So there are two different ways that you can look at information warfare, through a tactical lens, but also a strategic lens. So a tactical lens, think more in a military point of view. This can be to control your enemy C4I, which stands for command, control, communications, computers, and intelligence systems. So what you really want to do with that is shut down your enemy's um, communication system during war so they can't communicate between different battle groups. They can't use certain weapons um, because warfare has definitely revolutionized with the use of cyber. And it's essentially just to disrupt an adversary's military operations during conflict. 
So the US also looks at information warfare from this tactical lens. And you can see that because DOD is the main entity that does information operations for the US. And those can be classified as what they're called um, is PSYOPs. But China looks at information warfare also through this strategic lens. And I think it's really important to understand this. So this is something that the United States doesn't do well, because as I just mentioned, the US definitely has a more tactical view of information warfare. But the PRC, they see information warfare as a tool that can degrade an enemy psychologically over time. They can use it to alter public opinion and perception. They can sow division within a society and create chaos. And there's also the belief that cyber capabilities can influence the actions of adversaries. So overall, information warfare, it can weaken an enemy over time without having to resort to direct military conflict. And this goes back to what I was talking earlier about China's overarching defense doctrine of unrestricted and protracted warfare. So it's the use of information to weaken the target population's morale of the public and their public faith, um, faith in the government. So I want to move into now, like how does the PRC actually wage information warfare? So they use various cyber actors and, cy and cyber tools that are often implemented by official and non-official state-sponsored groups. So one common term that you might hear is APTs, that stands for Advanced Persist Persistent Threat Groups. And so China has is known to have about 20 of them. Some well-known ones are APT1, and another well-known is APT41. But also different military actors take part in doing these type of um, information warfare. And one of them is the Strategic Support Force, which I referenced a little bit earlier on. So APTs, they can be different military elements or they can be different parts of the PLA. They're threat actors and they're known, um, they can also be private sector. So it, it, it depends. They can be either military or private sector, but usually they are state sponsored in some different capacity. So as I mentioned before, APT1, that was run by the second bureau of the PLA and it was uncovered by Mandiant, which is a well-known cybersecurity for firm that has a lot of good research on advanced, pers advanced persistent threat groups, if that's something that you're interested in. So APT1, essentially what they did, they engaged in extensive cyber espionage to steal different governmental information and intellectual property. So that's just sort of the entities that you will see taking on these different um, information warfare and cyber warfare actions. So just moving on a little bit to information warfare in practice. So what's the whole point of focusing on Taiwan in this? Uh, so Taiwan is where the PRC concentrates majority of its cyber efforts. And that's in part because the interesting relationship between China and Taiwan, because uh, China wants reunification. And that's where they use a lot of their resources, a lot of their intelligence resources, a lot of their cyber resources to really force reunification. Um, so it's a good place to look because you know it's a high priority target for China and where they're going to use a lot of their resources. And PRC cyber attacks, from what I've been researching, they appear to be more aggressive on Taiwan than other targets. And as I'll get into later, I'll look at specific critical infrastructure attacks, um, which is something we haven't really seen too much of in the US. So it's a good way to gauge China's capabilities and tactics when looking at information warfare and cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. And also one other thing to note, it's important to note that Taiwan is a democracy and we're a democracy as well. So if you wanna see how information warfare and cyber attacks really can affect a democratic population, you wanna look at a case study in a country that is a democracy. Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about some specific attacks that I looked at throughout my paper. So one of them is a 2020 telecommunications and gas sector attack. So this was when the PRC targeted at least 10 different critical infrastructure companies in Taiwan. So one of these was CC CPC. So this actually is a Taiwanese state owned gasoline and gas firm and the largest gasoline supplier to Taiwan. So essentially for this particular attack, what happened, they target the payment system of the gas pumps. So that prevented for three days, people being able to pay through certain means to get gas. So if you think about it, how many people go to the gas station every day? If you're driving by, there's always a line. So just think if the payment system was down and how much chaos 
that can really cause in society. And it's just one little thing that you might not think about, but if you think about our critical infrastructure and how much we rely on gas, electricity, water, it becomes a big issue because if an adversary has access to these different critical infrastructure systems, they can really disrupt the daily life of the public. So this attack in particular, it was attributed to a China link threat group by Taiwan. And so essentially, as I said before, this was 10 different, in, um, 10 different companies. It wasn't just this one gas company. It was also a semiconductor companies, railroad. So it really was far reaching. Um, and this actually, something to really note about this is the timing of the attack. So it took place one week before Taiwan's presidential inauguration, and it's likely that the PRC launched this attack as a means of political deterrence, considering that 10 different entities attacked were all critical infrastructure. So what's the point of doing an attack like this? It can negatively impact the trust Taiwan, Taiwanese citizens have in their government and the trust in Taiwan's defense capabilities to ward off these different types of cyber attacks. So that's the first attack I looked at. Then the second one I looked at is a 2021 attack on Taiwan's financial sector. So the way that they did this cyber attack, it was a bunch of large and unusual purchases of Hong Kong stocks on different consumer trading accounts. So this caused a lot of the Taiwanese financial institutions and securities to suspend their online transaction for a couple days because they weren't sure if these transactions were real and it really caused a lot of confusion in the financial sector. So this also halted operations. And just think today if all of a sudden you pulled up the news and they said, Wall Street's down for a few hours, we're suspending all, all trading of stocks. That would cause chaos. So the financial sector is definitely something we have to look at when we're thinking of critical infrastructure security, even though you might not, not necessarily think of finances as critical infrastructure. So another thing interesting about this attack, it, they took a lot of PII data, which is personal identifying information, in brokerage data. So this wasn't just to solely disrupt the daily lives of citizens, um, it was also to gain something from that. Because one thing that you have to think and that China does, they absorb a lot of data in a bunch of different sectors, whether that's the healthcare sector, the science sector, they're taking all this data and we don't exactly know sometimes what they're doing with all the data, but if you just have a large repository of data, one day you might find a use for it. So we do have to be careful of protecting our data, especially PII. How would you feel if a foreign adversary had your social security, your address, your birthday, and just really knew a lot about you and they're thousands of miles away? So that could be a little bit uncomfortable to know that adversaries can easily gather our PII data. And then another thing to look at is the timing of this attack, because this took place in a time of high economic growth. So the last attack took place just in a couple days before the presidential inauguration, and now this one is in a time of economic growth. So there's definitely an importance of timing for all these attacks, because they want to maximize the impact that it has on society. And one of the goals of this type of attack is to damage the reputation of Taiwan's financial institutions. And then another attack I looked at is just government systems attacked. So in 2020, at least 10 different government agencies were attacked, and this was attributed to Chinese threat actors. So they accessed about 6,000 government um, agencies' emails. And according to Mandiant, which was the cybersecurity firm I referred to earlier today, it takes on average in Taiwan about 205 days before APT attacks are detected. So just think if a foreign adversary was in your company's email or you just had a random hacker in your company's email and you didn't know they were there for 205 days. Think of all the preparatory information that you can get from that. So the thing is, is that this threat is ongoing and taking 205 days to notice a threat actor is in your systems is very concerning. So this was attributed to two different Chinese hacking groups, Black Tech and Tidor. So these are more um, private sector advanced persistent threat groups. So what you can do in different attacks like this, you can actually gather information on the government's capabilities and intentions. And if you want to be able to defeat your adversary at any point, you have to know their capabilities and intentions. That is one of the main purposes of intelligence gathering. You want to know what your adversary has, what capabilities they have, how can they affect you? But not just their capabilities, what do they want to do? That's the key part to know. Because they might have all this capability, but they might have no interest in attacking you. 
So that, that can calculate into your different um, risk assessments. Then I looked at disinformation operations in this too, and this goes back to information warfare. So essentially what China does, they use social media to launch massive disinformation campaigns. So essentially what they do, they start with content farms and bots that publish disinformation on the internet, which then will get picked up by real social media users in real news sources. So this in turn amplifies the disinformation throughout the Taiwanese population. And it's important to note that this also happens in the United States as well. It's not just unique to Taiwan. So from April of 2021 to January of 2022, Taiwan's Information and Communication Security Division, they investigated 2,773 cases involving fake accounts that were created by different Chinese content farms. So they used different sites such as Facebook, CK101, um, WeChat, and so they really use social media as a way to disseminate their information because in the technology age with social media, things get disseminated extremely quickly. All you have to do is just publish it and then it's out there for everybody to see. So one recent example is COVID-19 disinformation. So what the PRC did on social media, they um, disseminated a lot of disinformation through these bots and content farms regarding the health measures that were implemented by the Taiwanese government. So what they would say, they would say that the Taiwanese government is faking the national case count and that COVID was far worse than it was. They would say that the country is going to go into a massive lockdown all of a sudden. And they also made claims that the government was going to shut off all the internet on the island. Um, so essentially what this did, it created a lot of mass chaos in a time when there was a lot of unknown information. Because if you guys go back to the beginning of the pandemic, when we didn't really know much about COVID-19 and all that chaos, it makes it a prime time to insert disinformation because you can maximize the impact that you create in a society. So I looked at a bunch of critical infrastructure attacks, but I also looked at disinformation as well. Because this all goes back to, as I was talking earlier, about the fusion with cyber and psychology. So you can see there was a lot of cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, but the whole purpose of those attacks was to degrade the public, the populations um, psychologically and to really get them to question their government, to create chaos within society. So you might be wondering like critical infrastructure and information operations, they don't really seem to match. But when you're looking at the PRC, you have to remember they have this fusion of cyber and psychology as a key cornerstone of their defense doctrine. So just look at um, some different key takeaways for the US. So we know by looking at this research, the PRC has the capability to successfully manipulate the narrative battlefield is what I like to call it. And that's just the information battlefield. So that could be social media, newspapers, just any information that you're getting. So they can successfully manipulate this battlefield through cyber means. A key tactic of the PRC is to target and attack critical infrastructure to weaken the public's trust in the government. And then one thing I really want to hit on is that the United States is not prepared to successfully neutralize PRC information operations in the cyber domain. And one thing I want to reference here is the Office of the Director of National Intelligence's 2022 annual threat report. It says, quote, China almost certainly is capable of launching cyber attacks that would disrupt critical infrastructure services within the United States, including against oil and gas pipelines and rail systems. So that is very concerning if you're reading that. And the whole thing and the whole point I'm trying to get across now is we have to be proactive in the cyber domain. Warfare is, cyber is going to be the future of warfare. And if we don't act now to safeguard um, our critical infrastructure, halt information operations, and then we won't be able to remain um, a major power in the world. So what I'm gonna start walking us into now is potential solutions that I was thinking as I was looking at this problem. So what I just wanna get across here, these are things that we can begin to implement. These are some things that we can continue. We don't have to do all four of these at once. You can pick and choose. These are just some different ways that I was thinking about how can we better defend ourselves in the cyber domain and really try to render these Chinese cyber attacks um, useless, so to say. So the first one that I do wanna talk about is, 
encouraging the private sector, and this is gonna center a lot on our critical infrastructure. So the most up-to-date presidential guidance on critical infrastructure is the Biden administration's National Security Memorandum on Improving Cybersecurity for Critical Infrastructure Cons Control Systems. And this was released in July 28th of 2021. So what this National Security Memorandum did, it established an industrial control system cybersecurity cyber initiative. So this is a voluntary effort between critical infrastructure companies and the federal government to improve cybersecurity in the different critical infrastructure systems. Wow, I'm moving the slides and no one told me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so this established an industrial control system cybersecurity initiative. So it's a voluntary effort between the private sector and the federal government. It's meant to improve cybersecurity in our critical infrastructure systems. So this is where different companies, they can choose to deploy governmental technology and systems that are provided by the government. And this can provide threat visibility, indications, detect detections, warnings, and response capabilities. So the main entity in the US that's responsible for safeguarding critical infrastructure is CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So that's managed mainly by DHS. And so they have a joint effort between DHS and 16 different critical infrastructure sectors. So they pull different CEOs from high companies. So for example, I don't know for sure, but like the CEO of AT&T might be on telecommunications and be working with DHS to help try to safeguard all of telecommunications in the US. But the thing to notice about this, it's totally voluntary. The government can't force countries to join this effort. The government can't really force different companies to strengthen their cyber defenses when it's critical infrastructure industries, because a lot of them are private. So this raises the issue, well, how do we encourage the private sector to really be pre proactive in this? Um, one thing that I thought of is that maybe the government, they can work with different insurers to offer monetary incentives to companies who have strong cybersecurity. So as you know, in a capitalist economy, a lot runs on profits. So if we can encourage the private sector and show them that they can gain money from actually improving their cybersecurity, they're gonna be more likely to do it on their own before it's after an attack and then they're looking back and say, holy crap, we just got cyber attacked and we were not prepared. By doing this, at least you'll be getting them to start think about improving their own cybersecurity. And just one fact that I found during my research is that the average cost of a data breach in the US is about $9.5 million. So if a company is cyber attacked, they're definitely gonna have to pay a lot of money for that. So if we can really capitalize on that and the cost of cyber attacks for companies, then we can get our critical infrastructure to start tightening uh, their own defenses. Okay, so now I'm going to move to number two, which is utilize the principle of reciprocity. So now this is a much more aggressive response to look at Chinese cyber attacks. So essentially, if you want to deter your adversary, you need to send a strong signal. So the US has to send a strong signal to the PRC. It will not tolerate critical infrastructure attacks and that if attacked, it will respond forcefully. So one way to do this is to implement the, pr the principle of reciprocity. So this is a lot more aggressive compared to economic sanctions or diplomatic protests. The whole idea of this is that any attack by Chinese hackers will be responded to in kind and this is so, this is drawing a red line. So I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2021, there was the cl colonial pipeline attack that was ultimately attributed to Russian actors, but it was never attributed to the Russian government, which is a big differential. Um, so then it becomes the issue, well, if it's a private threat actor that may have ties to the government, but it's not actually a military unit that did it, how do we respond? So we have to start thinking about this because cyber is a gray area and attribution is one of the biggest problems we have with cyber attacks. Because what happens if you attribute it wrong and then we go after an adversary and cyber attack them when it wasn't actually them? That is just going to turn into massive escalation. Um, so one problem that I sort of was trying to deal with when I was doing this research is how do you hold the private hacking groups accountable? Because we know that China and we know that Russia really use these private hacking groups and like will sort of let them run in their own cyber domains as long as they don't 
come after their own governments and help the governments when they need it. So that was one problem that I was wrestling with with my research because we do have a private hacking group in the US, Anonymous. And so what would happen if Anonymous decided to go attack the PRC? Under this principle of reciprocity, the US government would have to take some responsibility for that attack if we're gonna do the same thing. So that's just something to really consider. And to be totally honest, it's one solution that I haven't been able to think of yet. So then I'm going to move a little bit into more offensive cyber operations. Okay, yes. So if we wanna take on Chinese cyber operations, we also have to make sure we maintain US cyber superiority and preparedness. So the question is how exactly do we do this? One way is doing long range reconnaissance of Chinese networks, especially critical infrastructure networks, because we have to have the capability to take out their critical infrastructure because we already know that they have the capabilities as that was clearly stated in ODNI's 2022 threat report. So that's one possibility, but another thing I really wanna hit on that the US military can start doing if they aren't already doing is really thinking of cyber attacks and information operations in war gaming. So there's two different ways that you can look at this. There's one thing called red teaming. That's when you take on the role of your adversary and try to play out their own actions yourself. So that can help create a strategy against your adversary if you're really thinking in their own mindset. But one problem with red teaming, you have to be really careful of this thing called mirror imaging. And that's when you project your own biases on your adversary. So if we have US military personnel trying to take on the role of the PRC, we have to make sure we're not having our own biases of what the US would do in warfare. You have to really switch that mentality and take on the mind of your adversary, which is sometimes very hard to do. Another thing is called Solarium. And so President Eisenhower actually did um, Project Solarium under the Eisenhower administration. So he used this to create a strategy towards the Soviet Union. And that actually created a pretty um, successful strategy after the Truman administration and going away from containment against the Soviet Union. And as you can see here is a logo and it says US Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So I do know that the US has done some cyber solarium uh, research, which is definitely a good start. But one thing we definitely have to consider is how will critical infrastructure attacks and disinformation be used in a time of war? Because we're moving away from kinetic war into war on these, all these domains. And as I mentioned before, unrestricted war and protracted war, it's not kinetic war. It's war everywhere. And it's war when you don't even think about it. It's in the narrative battlefield, the economic battlefield. You'll still see military and diplomacy being used, but it's really just trying to attack a country overall and all things that make their national power. So next, I want to go into this whole um, notion about educating the public. And this is one part of my research that I really got into, and I think this is one of the strongest potential solutions that we have to focus on. So if we want to combat information operations, we have to neutralize the disinformation operations. And you need the public, the private sector, and the government all to play different roles. So I just want to point out that America's always been a major target for disinformation operations, and that disinformation operations are not a new thing. For example, the Soviet Union constantly launched disinformation operations against the United States before and during the Cold War. Russia still does it today. You can even go back to Revolutionary War history and see disinformations were used. This is not a new concept at all. Just the new piece is technology, and that just amplifies it even more and makes these disinformation operations more aggressive. So it's also important to understand the goal of Chinese disinformation campaigns, as well as Russian disinformation campaigns. They're to create chaos in American society and to further polarize society. So what disinformation campaigns typically do and what the PRC does, they target the far right and the far left, because if they target these two polar opposites, they can pull them deeper apart. So that widens the gap in society and that creates more of a polarized environment and more chaos in general. So most of these disinformation operations aren't going after the general middle ground of the public. So that's one thing to really remember. 
in disinformation, it always starts with something that's par partially true or believable to grab the attention of the target audience. It has to be something in the realm of possibility for to get people to believe it. And then you might hear a lot of different terms. You might hear disinformation versus misinformation. So those are two different things. And I really want to stress that this is about disinformation. Disinformation is when you have the intent to deceive somebody. And your goal is to deceive somebody and really has more malicious intent. Misinformation is when somebody is spreading a false narrative that they genuinely believe is true. So the intention is different behind that. So you might see some people share different information. If they believe it's true, that's classified as misinformation. But if somebody has the direct intent to deceive, which is what our adversaries do, that is disinformation. So what's the role of the private sector? So the role of the private sector is what I found. They can remove the general sources of this disinformation. So they can do removal of fake accounts, prohibit purchases of ads by authoritarian governments, and alert users where posts are coming from. Because by doing this and taking these three specific actions, it's going to go over the foreign accounts. It's not going to be targeting domestic accounts, so to say. Because if we can remove the sources of them, then there won't be as much disinformation to actually amplify. So then that's one role that the private sector can do and different companies such as Twitter and Facebook have already started trying to really disable and take down a lot of these bots, which is one um, very helpful tool to combat disinformation. So then the government can also play a role in this. And the way I say the government should play a role in this is for educating the public. So for example, ODNI, their National um, Counterintelligence and Security Center, they already have this newsroom. And this newsroom has a lot of helpful one-pagers. Uh, the one up here is actually one on different like information manipulation and different tips to help the public on avoiding, avoiding getting caught up in this disinformation. Um, and then you also have a lot of intelligence elements, national security elements now creating their own podcasts, one being the Langley Files that CIA just started. So this is all helpful, but it still hasn't gotten to the point where the general public consumes this information. People who study national security might see it. People who are particularly interested in these topics might see it. But the general American probably has no idea that these resources exist. One thing I thought that was really interesting last year, Bill Evanina, he was the former director of NCSC at ODNI. He actually went on 60 Minutes and gave an interview about how China is taking a lot of American um, genomic data in the healthcare sector and how they're doing that through different investments, different mergers and acquisitions. And so he sort of went on to sound the alarm a bit in this 60 minute interview, and it actually did really well. It got picked up by traditional news sources that a lot of Americans look at, and the word really got out. And so people started to think, wow, I had no idea that this was going on. So the government needs to start getting more involved um, and to really help more of a public awareness campaign. Um, but at the end of the day, it is the public's responsibility to combat disinformation, and that comes down to media literacy, and that really comes down to just people taking a second to look at what they're consuming and not just immediately taking things at face value. So the different tools that I thought of from the private sector and government can at least help encourage more people in the public just to pause, just to take a few seconds. And those few seconds can really make a big difference in neutralizing disinformation campaigns. So this is sort of the thought that I wanna leave everybody with. So a lot of my presentation, it was focused around what threats we're facing but I want to point out that there is a big opportunity here. China is increasingly relying on technology and data. So this becomes a massive vulnerability to them. At the beginning of the presentation, I emphasized how the PRC sees information control and information dominance as the key to growing its power. But the more it relies on AI, the more it relies on cyber, it gives other countries the ability to exploit this vulnerability. So this massive data breach happened a few months ago on the Shanghai police data um, database. And essentially what happened about data on 1 billion Chinese citizens were leaked. So this was maybe one of the largest data breaches in history. And everybody's thinking about, oh, the PRC is attacking our data. 
we're losing all our data in all these different mergers, acquisitions, cyber attacks, but it's happening to them too. Um, so I just really want to close that as China collects more data, it's going to become a lot harder for them to secure it. So in some ways, the PRC is just as vulnerable to cyber attacks as we are. And that's just what I want to conclude with tonight. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this in any ways that I can really improve this research. Thank you. Let's give a hand to Ms. Hannah. And we have just a, a few minutes for questions. So if you guys have questions, I can walk around with the mic uh, and you guys can ask. Hey, thanks for taking the time to present to us. My question was, uh, what thresholds of knowledge do we face right now when trying to understand and combat the CCP? So any kind of obstacles to understanding that they are throwing up and making us stumble over, anything we're doing to sabotage ourselves? And then what other lines of inquiry could a future researcher or student take from what you've developed so far? So one thing if you're thinking about Chinese cyber attacks in the military domain and like C4I, the biggest problem for us, I would say, is that our, we strictly look at it in those terms. We strictly look at it through a military lens. And that's one thing the US does poorly in a lot of respects. We have a very large military, the best military in the world, but we have a very narrow mindset when you're looking at it. So then I would argue that the military doesn't really take into account the fusion of psychology that I was talking a lot about. So then if you're, if you're looking at the PRC is gonna take out our C4I, well, what else are they gonna do in addition to that? Because there's gonna be disinformation operations during warfare, that might not necessarily be our C4I. Um, so if you're looking at these different attacks, I would say the biggest issue is that we only look at it through a military lens and that we have to start changing that way of thought if we truly want to understand the PRC as an adversary and how they're going to wage warfare against us in the future um, in the cyber domain. And then do you have any, based on your research so far right now, do you have any additional topics that's like, hey, you know, if someone took my paper and went one step further, what are some one step furthers you would say we would expect? One thing that I heard a lot about when I presented this at the Citadel that people would be interested to see is how much has the PRC learned from Russian disinformation operations? Um, because Russia has been doing disinformation operations for longer than the PRC, I would argue, especially during the Cold War. They did it a lot in different newspapers and they got really, really good at it. And we know that the PRC is constantly looking at Russia for different experiences and to learn from their experiences and enhance. So that would be one area that I would say definitely would be ripe for research and a good area to look into. Yeah, yeah, you can start it off. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again for everybody for coming out. Uh, and thank you for Jillian Han for giving a brilliant lecture. If you are at all interested in attending any of our other upcoming lectures, making a gift to IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please feel free to visit us at iwp.edu or grab a staff member after the lecture. Thank you.